Good afternoon. I'm Les Shepard, Chief Architect of the General Services Administration. I'd like to be the first to welcome you to the Moynihan Symposium on Public Design. Today we mark the 50th anniversary of Daniel Patrick Moynihan's Guiding Principles for Federal Architecture, which President Kennedy signed in 1962. Within GSA's Public Building Service, the Guiding Principles provide the foundation for design excellence and are the benchmark for how we measure quality. Over the past 50 years, design strategies have evolved to include issues of sustainability and security. Today, we need to, have a, we need to think about and discuss how these principles remain relevant. Senator Moynihan wanted all of our buildings to reflect the nation's greatness. When he wrote, public buildings shall reflect the vigor, enterprise, and stability of the American government that was then and remains an exciting design challenge. It's also an obligation to the American taxpayer who deserve and expect nothing less. I know that each of you here today wholeheartedly agree with that. Uh, please, welcome, please join me in welcoming the Acting Commissioner of the Public Building Service, Linda Chiro, who will tell you more about uh, the goals of today's event. Linda? Good afternoon. I'm truly honored to spend this afternoon with all of you. On behalf of all the federal agencies that design and construct the public realm, both here and abroad, welcome. Our duty is not only to save taxpayer dollars, but also to steward it. One important way we do that is by championing high quality design. Effective design boosts productivity of our public buildings. It minimizes resource consumption. It engenders a sense of belonging. Simply, design creates value. We strive to achieve value in everything we do. The Morning Hand Symposium on Public Design celebrates my colleagues' shared dedication to excellence. More than 2,000 people are here today. Many of you have traveled from all over the country on behalf of studios specializing in architecture, engineering, landscapes, urban and rural planning, interior design, and construction. You represent the judiciary, the legislature, as well as multiple federal agencies that range from the Army Corps of Engineers and the National Park Service to the Department of State. Also included are members of the National Registry of Peer Professionals, design and construction professionals who perform a vital service as reviewers for GSA. So whether you represent the public or private sector, we all understand our responsibilities to make buildings, landscapes, workplaces, and even virtual environment energy efficient, resilient, and beautiful. Today we redouble our commitment. By finding continued inspiration in Senator Moynihan's legacy, we raise the bar of quality. I want to thank my colleagues for producing such an impressive program today. And I'd also like to wish all of you a very productive and rich day. And now I'm going to turn it back over to Les, who's going to give us a brief roadmap of uh, what to expect today. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. This afternoon is an opportunity to assess the federal government as a champion of design. Momentarily, we'll watch a video to introduce or reacquaint you with the guiding principles and how Senator Moynihan's words have had an impact on public buildings for the last 50 years. Then the president of the American Institute of Architects, Jeffrey Potter, uh, will join us to give a special award to Senator Moynihan's daughter in honor of his many contributions to public buildings. Our panel discussions start after the award presentation. The first conversation focuses on the federal government's historic design investments and the ways that Moynihan and other public servants have advocated for high quality design. That panel will be moderated by Paul Goldberger. The second panel looks ahead as our speakers discuss, discuss best practices and innovations. This should help us identify the federal government's current successes or propose new paths for moving forward. That panel will be moderated by Marilyn Jordan Taylor. 
and we're going to conclude the day with a roundtable discussion. Special thanks to the professional organizations with, with whom we have collaborated for today, to the American Institute of Architects, the American Society of Landscape Architects, the American Planning Association, and many others, thank you. We're especially thankful to the distinguished thought leaders who will be taking the stage this afternoon. With that, I think we're ready for the video. Thank you, enjoy the day. The buildings we build are the connective tissue that makes us a nation. It's impossible to make a building without having it mean something. The one constancy is the federal government. Working together, we uncover what the goals are and we share authorship. What is the face, what is the character of a public building in America today? is to know that the government actually cares is really important. On June 1, 1962, the course of federal architecture was altered. Buried in a detailed report on the urgent need for new federal buildings by President Kennedy's Ad Hoc Committee on Federal Office Space was a seemingly benign page titled, Guiding Principles for Federal Architecture. Penned by Daniel Patrick Moynihan, then a young assistant to the Secretary of Labor, the guiding principles were meant to raise the quality of new federal buildings by creating architecture that resonated with all Americans and provided enriching civic spaces. Everybody wanted another building. I was assigned to do work at this by uh, Secretary Goldberg, and we thought, well, why not, as we set about this new building boom, why don't we put some uh, structures in there, some guidelines about what these buildings should look like. So I wrote a little one-page guidelines for federal architecture. Guiding Principles for Federal Architecture. In the course of its consideration of the general subject of federal office space, the committee has given some thought to the need for a set of principles which will guide the government in the choice of design for federal buildings. The committee takes it to be a matter of general understanding that the economy and suitability of federal office space derive directly from the architectural design. The belief that good design is optional or in some way separate from the question of the provision of office space itself does not bear scrutiny and in fact, invites the least efficient use of public money. The design of federal office buildings, particularly those to be located in the nation's capital, must meet a twofold requirement. First, it must provide efficient and economical facilities for the use of government agencies. Second, it must provide the visual testimony to the dignity, enterprise, vigor, and stability of the American government. It should be our object to meet the test of Pericles' evocation to the Athenians, which the President commended to the Massachusetts Legislature in his address of January 9, 1961. We do not imitate, for we are a model to others. The committee is also of the opinion that the federal government, no less than other public and private organizations concerned with the construction of new buildings, should take advantage of the increasingly fruitful collaboration between architecture and the fine arts. With these objects in view, the committee recommends a three-point architectural policy for the federal government. One, the policy shall be to provide requisite and adequate facilities in architectural style and form which is distinguished and which will reflect the dignity, enterprise, vigor, and stability of the American national government. Major emphasis should be placed on the choice of designs that embody the finest contemporary American architectural thought. Specific attention should be paid to the possibilities of incorporating into such designs qualities which reflect the regional architectural traditions of that part of the nation in which buildings are located. Where appropriate, fine art should be incorporated in the designs with emphasis on the work 
of living American artists. Designs shall adhere to sound construction practice and utilize materials, methods, and equipment of proven dependability. Buildings shall be economical to build, operate, and maintain, and should be accessible to the handicapped. Two, the development of an official style must be avoided. Design must flow from the architectural profession to the government and not vice versa. The government should be willing to pay some additional costs to avoid excessive uniformity in design of federal buildings. Competitions for the design of federal buildings may be held where appropriate. The advice of distinguished architects ought to, as a rule, be sought prior to the award of important design contracts. Three, the choice and development of the building site should be considered the first step of the design process. This choice should be made in cooperation with local agencies. Special attention should be paid to the general ensemble of streets and public places of which federal buildings will form a part. Where possible, buildings should be located so as to permit a generous development of landscape. Hello, I am Luke Russert, and I have fond memories of Senator Moynihan, both as my father's good friend and mentor, but also as someone who sought to find the worth and value in both sides of every issue. The guiding principles for federal architecture are still relevant half a century later. They advocate for authentic expression by our nation's most talented architects and artists, universal accessibility, sound, cost-effective construction and operation, and a positive, engaging presence in the communities in which government facilities are located. Public buildings, as well as monuments, landscapes, and infrastructure, play a special role in society. They give visual form and bear witness to the values and aspirations of a society and its members. Underlying the principles is the premise that public works in our nation should not simply reveal, but also infuse democratic values. Clearly, it's important that government delivers services to the public. At the same time, it's impossible to make a building without having it mean something about the relationship of the people to the government of the United States. They have to find a way um, to you know, address the question of what the, what the building means and what it says, because it will affect everybody working in the building. It will affect everybody that comes to the building. In an open and democratic society where economics and politics and a variety of other circumstances wax and wane, the one constancy is the federal government. For the senator to have the understanding that architecture could convey not the power of the federal government, but the power of our system that says that these buildings should actually be transparent and open and of their day is of tremendous historical consequence. In word and spirit, the guiding principles have profoundly impacted federal investments in architecture and design. They guided redevelopment of historic Pennsylvania Avenue in the nation's capital, turning America's decaying ceremonial Main Street into a lively urban destination for living, working, and entertainment. They underpin modern landmarks, from the Federal Center in Chicago, designed by Mies van der Rohe, to the National Renewable Energy Laboratory's new Net Zero Research Support Facility in Golden, Colorado. I think a lot of the success of really good architecture has to be about everybody sharing a common goal, being able to communicate or identify what the goal is. It's not that the goal is obvious ever in the beginning, but working together, we uncover what the goals are and we share authorship. The principles have endured because dedicated public employees have applied them to achieve the mission and goals of their specific agencies. Citizens, designers, and civil servants alike can ensure the principles continued longevity by interpreting their meaning for a changing society. The federal government must be responsible to contemporary society and the demographics of our society. It's a very different problem than it was 100 years ago. What is the face, what is the character of a public building in America today? I mean, I think it's a big question. 
What is it supposed to look like? What it, how does it fit into its community? How, how does it push back at its community? Transformations taking place today, and those we cannot yet foresee will inspire new ways to embody American ingenuity and purpose. Like America's foundational documents, the guiding principles for federal architecture are adaptable to address these changes. It's brilliantly written and should be read more often and should be understood by the public even better. I think just to know that the government actually cares, our government is actually taking steps to implement these things is really important. It's a great moment to revisit it. And I think this should be a, a national discussion amongst all of us that care deeply about the principles that he's set forward. Each one of us, you, I, everyone, has a responsibility to, to make sure that the built environment is as beautiful, as, as efficient, as, uh, as functional, and as representative of our culture as it can be. Architecture is one of the most visible and enduring ways the government can represent its values across time. The guiding principles codified the high standards that federal architecture has sought to achieve since the nation's founding. But the challenge and the ultimate responsibility for designers and public officials alike remains the same now as it's always been, to continually and clearly evaluate our work for the American people. Continued excellence in architecture and design is a way to show that the federal government aims high, that its citizens deserve the best, and that the public realm matters. What a great production. Uh, it speaks very highly to the commitment that the federal government has had for a number of years to the built environment. My name is Paul Mendelson. I'm from the American Institute of Architects. I'm here on behalf of the AIA. Unfortunately, Jeff Potter, our president, was detained and will not be able to make it. But I have some remarks that I'd like to make on his behalf. Good afternoon. I'd like you to join me in a quick trip back in time when a Frenchman was prowling around in the vicinity of this convention center. In those days, he would have been walking in broad fields and woods when he wasn't ankle deep in the area's numerous wetlands. Pierre L'Enfant was on a mission. He was on a mission to draw on what was essentially a blank slate, the outline of something that promised to be extraordinary, the capital city of a free people. General Washington hired L'Enfant because he wanted nothing but the best, which of course back then meant by meant buying French. Jefferson was of the same mind. The author of the Declaration of Independence was so interested in the quality of the buildings that would house this democracy after all. He had been to Paris. He entered the competition anonymously to design the house of the people, the capital, the universal symbol of our democracy. He lost eventually to a doctor named Thornton who was also the architect of the Octagon, which in 1902 was purchased by the AIA and it is, or was its national headquarters. But I digress just a little bit. The point I was to make is that both men, Washington and Jefferson, and Adams too, I'll get to him in just a moment, were passionately engaged in the shaping of the public buildings of this city and how they related to one another. To them, it was a matter of some consequence. Now fast forward to the darkest days of the Civil War. The Union needed ammunition to defend itself. No place was more wanting of defense than this city, which was surrounded by Confederate troops. Nevertheless, President Lincoln diverted precious iron desperately needed for armaments to build and complete the Capitol Dome, which he saw as a symbol of this nation's ability to survive. I imagine were th there were those who found Lincoln's preoccupation with an architectural project as folly. After all, the outcome of the war was still in doubt. President Lincoln, however, was of a different mind. He understood the power of architecture to proclaim to the world that a government of the people, by the people, and for the people would not perish from the earth. And so the work was done under the guidance of the architect of the Capitol, 
Thomas Eustick Walter, who four years earlier had been one of the 13 founders of the American Institute of Architects. Four decades after its founding in New York, the AI moved to Washington, DC. The very first project the AI embarked on was something all of us have come to know as the Macmillan Plan. This visionary document became the blueprint for a beautiful, vibrant city. We found us, find ourselves celebrating today in that city, and I welcome all of you to convention for those of you that are going to remain here for the remainder of the week. It was a visionary concept supported by the President Theodore Roosevelt and both sides of the aisle, a magnificent act of bipartisanship. The torch lit more than two centuries ago by our nation's founders and lovingly tended by some of our country's greatest heroes has been passed to you and me. To us falls the privilege and responsibility to carry forward the legacy of Washington, Jefferson, and Lincoln, leaders who believed with a passion that how and what we build matters, that it's a reflection of our most fundamental values and affirmation that a free people is capable of bold action on behalf of future generations, generations that will say with pride and gratitude, look, they did this for us. In this context, President John Adams deserves equal time. This is a quote from a letter he wrote to his beloved Abigail. I must study politics and war that my sons may have liberty to study mathematics and philosophy. My sons ought to study mathematics, philosophy, geography, natural history, naval architecture, navigation, commerce, and agriculture in order to give their children a right to study painting, poetry, music, architecture, statuary, tapestry, and porcelain. Painting, poetry, music, architecture, statuary, tapestry, and porcelain. Useless, perhaps, to those for whom value is calculated in terms of net worth, but in truth, the very food that quickens the heart and feeds the human soul. I cannot leave this stage without taking this opportunity to recognize one whose spirit hovers over this room, one whose life continues to inspire all of us here to aim high whenever we are given the privilege of committing to stone, metal, and glass the ideals of this democracy. Of course, I am referring to the late Daniel Patrick Moynihan, honorary AIA, a prince without peer. It is fitting, therefore, in the presence of his colleagues, family, and friends, to offer a humble tribute to the legacy of this great man. With your permission, I would like to call to the stage his daughter, Mora. We actually have a citation, a presidential citation that I would like to award to Mora uh, in legacy and recognition of your father's great work, who inspired the guiding principles for federal architecture. And it reads as follows. The guiding principles for federal architecture, which renewed the promise of this nation's founders, who believed that what we build should reflect our highest ideals and dedicated servant of the public good, who had the vision to see and advocate for the rebirth of Pennsylvania Avenue, America's Main Street. He has left a lasting legacy that will inspire succeeding generations to cherish a commitment to excellence as the visible sign of a vibrant democracy. Signed, Jeffrey Potter, FAIA 2012 President. Maura. Thank you. You're quite welcome. Congratulations. We appreciate you being here today. I'll just say a couple of yep, photographs. We're going to stand for a photograph first. Oh, okay. okay. I, I want to thank the AIA so much for this honor. And um, I feel like uh, it is appropriate that I don't speak but that I speak for my late father, Pat Moynihan, whom I know many of you knew and worked with. Uh, and uh, I selected some quotations of his about architecture and public space that I thought would be appropriate to the wonderful occasion. The point about public space is that it is public, and people who own nothing much in their own right have a part of that space. 
the notion of civitas, of a citizen, of a person with a right and a responsibility to be there and participate in a public space. That is what it means to be a republic. Our cities are recovering from the trauma induced by the interstate highway system. Open space just disappeared from our cities, enough so that the highway took you out of the city and there was nothing to bring you back. Today, that way of thinking is over. Is that true? I should hope so. Just need to confirm. This is one of my favorites from the early 70s. The US government suffers from an edifice complex. <laughs> this is from 1999, just prior to dad's retirement from the Senate. Some years back, I wrote, architecture is inescapably a po political art and it reports faithfully for ages to come what the political values of a particular age were. Surely ours must be openness and fearlessness in the face of those who hide in the darkness. Precaution, yes. Sequester, no. And this is in 2000 when Dad retired from the Senate to then Senator Hillary Clinton who succeeded him in the New York Senate regarding a 27 million upstate restoration project that he had labored long to secure the funds for. I never gave up hope, however, that our desire and capacity for greatness would return to a degree they have, but it is up to a new generation to renew the greatness of our cities. And in closing, I just want to say, I only have two regrets. One is that my father, Pat Moynihan, isn't here to accept this award, and that his friend, Paul Bearer, at his funeral, and former AA GSA commissioner, Bob Peck, isn't here either. But I thank the AIA for this honor, and I wish you all the best. Thank you so much. Where do I go out? Are you waiting for me? I have a couple more comments to Pardon? make. I have a couple more comments to make, and then we're going to leave. Uh, Maura, thank you very much for sh in sharing those inspiring words from your father. Uh, they, it's amazing to me how they can still be so contemporary and, and applicable to uh, the same types of issues that we're dealing with. So thank you very much for, for sharing that. We appreciate the thoughtfulness and uh, invitation to speak and the courtesy of your attention. Look forward to seeing you, and Jeff looks forward to seeing you uh, at convention um, as the week progresses. Thank you very much for the opportunity.